Hello and welcome to another episode of Rapidly Aging Tech. Today we're going to be doing something long-winded and hopefully interesting. We're going to be building, in this case here, which is a beige server workstation style case. You can tell that because of how A tall it is and B, all the five and a quarter bays in it. We're going to be building a computer with it using this motherboard. In its protective packaging, this is a dual socket 8 Pentium Pro motherboard. So I hope you're excited because this is going to be, well, one of my more interesting computers. Let's start with the case itself. We have one, two, three, four, five, five and a quarter bays, two floppy drive bays, three and a half. We have a power button, which feels fairly substantial. We have a, looks like a specialty light, a hard drive light, power and the reset button which is recess so you don't bump it. If we take a look at the back we have something else that's quite interesting. First of all there's a top section which is ventilated because it actually comes off and I'll show that. There's a hard drive mount underneath here. But back here we have two redundant 300 watt ATX power supplies. This is pretty interesting. They're also hot swappable. Here we have power in, a reset button, a fuse, and this is something you don't see very often, um, a power out for a monitor. We have a standard a traditional ATX backplate, a 60 millimeter exhaust fan, um, punch outs for different uh, connectors, and then your PCI card expansion slot area. A question you may rightly have is, well how do you remove, how is a power supply hot swappable? They're kind of difficult to remove. You have to disconnect all your cables. You have to unscrew them. Well, this system is a bit different. Um, this, there is a uh, back plane that these two connect into that all the wires connect into. So the wires are connected to the back plane. Back plane is connected to the power supplies. If you want to remove these, you have to do a few um, little maneuvers, and it's pretty dang easy. So what you'll do is you'll take these tabs on the side and you'll push them in, then you just pull the power supply out. And you'll notice that it has these connectors here. And inside, otherwise it looks like a standard power supply, just instead of cabling you have these connectors. These connect into the back plane. We look inside, we can see all the bits and bobbles, including the slot where the power supply connects into. The upper power supply is much the same situation. Clearly the power supply system was designed for systems that needed to be running 24-7, zero downtime, and that's what the um, documentation surrounding them indicates. So another neat feature which I mentioned is that this top panel comes off and you actually need to remove it to remove the sides. And below you'll see a hard drive um, mounting position along with uh, enough room to allow cables to come through. The steel of this case is quite thick and heavy duty. I'm not sure who the manufacturer was, but it seems like a pretty high quality case. Fit and finish seems pretty decent as well. I purchased this on eBay from a UK dealer um, known as Evercase. All right, down to some of the more interesting details. I'm sure you'd like to know what the centerpiece is here. And this is the Micronix or Micron ICS W6LI um, Intel using the 440FX chipset, dual socket eight. It has currently installed, I'll bring it closer here. It's currently installed a 512 megabytes of RAM, which was I'm sure pretty large for the era. Um, I really do love how um, bulky and thick these uh, sticks of RAM are. All right, there's one CPU in there. I'll reveal what that is soon enough. You have the 20 pin C, uh, motherboard power. Here is obviously the second socket. We have the voltage regulator um, connector because it uses a separate VRM. I'm not sure why, but that's what they did. Have your PCI expansion slots. 
your ISA. These two share a expansion slot out the back, so if you use one, the other one is unusable because they're too close together. Um, over here, we have your ID connectors, your floppy drive connector. And as you can see, and this is something that peeved me a little bit, um, I was unable to find a version that had the built-in SCSI, uh, both 50 pin and 68 pin. Um, so we're using an expansion card to fill in that void. The front panel connectors are laid out in the old fashioned way, poking out the front. This looks much easier to work with because I can actually read and see what they are. And since it's a straight line, it's easy to not get confused. The back is a fairly standard traditional ATX um, backside, only it has no built in USB, even though there are references on the board to USB, so it certainly existed. Um, and there's no built in Ethernet either. We have PS2. We have um, parallel and serial ports. We have uh, I think this would be a game controller MIDI out and your audio. Um, I do like how they're all just plain black rather than the different multicolors that came with later standards. Hopefully it won't confuse me at all. The heat sinks that we're using today um, come from compact uh, ProLiant servers of the era. Uh, based upon diagrams I've looked at, for what Intel recommended for the heat sinks for these CPUs, these um, either meet or exceed those standards. They have a fairly thick base, um, a lot of fins, a lot of surface area. I suspect that these would be acceptable even for passive cooling, but I really don't want to risk it. So we will be zip tying some Noctua 60 millimeter fans to the heat sinks so that they actually have some airflow. This is the VRM module, which hopefully works. I haven't tested it. Um, the only thing I've tested with this motherboard is I've run MemTest with one CPU and the RAM. So hopefully everything will be fine. It's probably the moment some of you have been waiting for. What CPUs am I using in this thing? There are multiple Pentium Pros. What would I do? Well, um, something you may find have guessed based upon some of my videos um, in the past, and you'll probably see, come to understand in videos in the future, I prefer things to be the best they can possibly be. So the final form, which means I picked the Blacktop 200 megahertz Pentium Pro with one megabyte of L2 cache. That is a nice looking chip and massive too compared to other CPUs. So here's the chip and it has a uh, aluminum top to it. You can see that there's the separation between the, oh, I'm sure the silicon, um, I'm not sure if it's using a ceramic base at all, and the aluminum heat spreader on top. And you can tell it's a massive die because it has um, large uh, cache chips. If you compare that to an Athlon XP, in size, you'll see that it's fairly large and the Athlon XP's chip is very small, it's just rests on a substrate. And this is an LGA 775 chip, much smaller as well. For the video card, since there is no AGP slot on this motherboard, we are limited to PCI. And for that purpose, we have picked the NVIDIA GeForce 6200, 256 megabyte. Um, this seems to be one of the faster cards for PCI. Looks like uh, ATI Radian had something in the 1500 series, but um, the operating system I'm gonna try to use, since I don't have a flavor of NT, is Windows 2000. In Windows 2000, the maximum ATI drivers go up to the 850 series. We'll be using a, a USB card to give us some, some USB compatibility. I do happily have PS2 mice and keyboards, but you never know when you need it. We're also using an Adaptex SCSI card. This has um, 50 pin and 68 pin. It's PCIe and then it has a connector out the back. Here's the card itself and its protective packaging. We're also using a PCI Ethernet card. Um, I picked this and most of these components, including the USB card, because they had Windows 2000 drivers. Now bench testing 
is the smartest thing to do. And I'm probably going to skip over that or at least not film it. But what you'd want to do is put on the essentials and see if everything runs properly. I have bench tested earlier with just one CPU and all the RAM. Everything was fine. Um, these CPUs, um, even though they were impressive for their time, they're fairly slow now. Um, mem test um, seems a little choppy. Um, the timer was, wasn't was um, smooth. But it was able to do the test. So now we're going to install the CPU. First we're going to want to lift up on the latch here to unlock the socket. So now that's open. Now on most modern sockets there's some sort of clear indicator as to where, how to orient the chip. Here it doesn't seem to be as clear cut. Um, we have a, a more pronounced notch on this side but nothing really on the socket indicating how to locate it. If you look on the bottom here you notice that on this side the groupings of pins in the corners are just bundles of four. On this side you'll see that they're bundles of five. I'm not sure how well you can see that. If we look on the board over here there are little clusters of five and over here there are clusters of four. So that gives us the orientation. Now these are thicker pins and kind of an older socket. So this is zero insertion force for the most part, but sometimes you gotta gently guide it. If you're having to force anything, you've done something very wrong. But that went down pretty solidly. We should be able to lock it down tight. And now we've installed a Pentium Pro CPU. All right, as you can see, this uh, heat sink is a bit grungy, especially on the bottom. We're gonna be using a little bit of Arctic Silver Thermal uh, Material Remover. Just put a few drops on there, let it sit a bit, and then wipe it with something preferably lint-free. And then we'll be, after that, we'll use the thermal surface purifier on it and on the top of the CPU. And then we'll put down our thermal paste. I'll skip that part, but I'll show you the pasting. So on the chip, you can see that there are um, four white dots. Those are there to tell you where the um, actual uh, chip itself is underneath this heat spreader. On the older models, um, it was raised in gold and you could actually, you know, it was a little higher than the rest of the surface. You could see it. On this one, it's a smooth, uh, even surface. So they need to put some indicators. Since it's so long, rather than doing the dot method, we're actually going to be doing a line method on it. On uh, most normal CPUs that are a little more on the square side, the dot is perfectly acceptable. And I usually do the dot. But this will require a line. I figured that I'd show you uh, what I was talking about here. This is what I was originally going to do this build out of. Um, I couldn't find black tops at the time, so I found this. This is the 200 megahertz, 512 kilobyte uh, L2 cache version. CPU. As you can see, this is gold and it's raised up higher than the um, ceramic base. So this, there'd be no question where you put the thermal paste. But on the blacktop, there is. These do look a lot better in my opinion, but they're not as powerful. Alright, so we'll apply our thermal paste. I'll probably get the amount a little wrong, but here we go. I want to do start a line. It probably doesn't need to be all that thick because it will spread out. I'll put a little, little blob right in the middle there too. Now that should be more than enough for what we're working with, especially when these chips, the first models, I think don't think you need a, you needed a heat spreader on, but of course these light ones are a bit hot. Now as you can see looking at this CPU, when I put the heat sink on, I put it on in this orientation with the sort of uh, the section that I would say is more meant for your fingers on this side. However, as you can see, once it goes down fully, it's buried underneath here. And you need to, essentially, you need to use a small screwdriver to um, finish it or to unlatch it. But on this side, by the um, hinge of the socket, there's a lot more space. See what I mean? I think the smart way 
would be to put it in the opposite way I did this, so to have more um, room with my fingers over here. So that's what I'm going to try to do. And forgive me, there probably is going to be a solid amount of fumbling, and I'll probably have to edit things out. If, I, if this doesn't work, I'll try it the other way. So I want to set the CPU down fairly evenly. Once I get that side latched, and now I need to push this side down to latch over here. Oh, that was much easier. Well, I'm clearly a moron for what I did over on this one. Yeah, boy. The last remaining step here is to put in the voltage regulator module. So based upon the way the socket works, where the pins are here and the latching systems on this side, it should, it's just reasonable to assume that it goes in like this. Also, we don't want it interfering with the heatsink. I'm trying to be careful not to bend anything. There we go, and the two little latches on each side. Connect and we should be good to go. Okie dokie. I took the liberty of putting on the fans. As you can see, I have zip ties going through um, these heat sinks. There are little um, cuts in the side, which give plenty of room to maneuver zip ties. These are Noctua 60 millimeter fans. They are a standard three pin, and this motherboard does have three pin power connectors. However, in my early testing with a different fan that was known working, um, when I plugged it in, not only did it not spin, it got really hot. So I'm not gonna trust those. I don't know whether there was an old standard at one point for fans for these boards, so I'm just using Molex adapters. I took the liberty of installing the motherboard into the case without showing you. Um, it's one of the more frustrating aspects of computer building in my mind, mainly getting it lined up with the IO shield. Um, you can see that it's fairly tight fit in this case and that I had to remove all the fancy drive cages like this one, which is, goes up here, which might not fit at the end of all this. That's going to suck. But anywho, um, the motherboard is in place. All the I got the holes lined up uh, and everything, so this should be good to go. I'll have to put back in the rear fan, put back in the forward fan, which is in a cage. And before I do that, I'll need to do the front panel connectors, which I will do um, when you're doing it yourself. Always consult the motherboard manual just to make sure you have all the details correct. Luckily, since it's this older style that's lined up like this, while it is an issue with space over here, um, everything is listed out fairly clearly. Um, I don't see positive or negative, but I'm sure I can figure it out. All right, as you can see, I've taken the liberty of getting this machine more complete. Um, you've probably all seen a graphics card get put in, but here it is. It seems to have a little bit of a bend to it. Hopefully it'll be fine. CPUs are in place along with their fans. The rear fan has been put back into place so it's not connected. Um, as an initial test, uh, you guys don't notice because of the magic of editing, but this has actually taken all day. Not because I've been doing this all day, but other things came up. So I need to finish up. And this video is probably going to be fairly long anyway, so I'm going to split it up into two parts. What we're going to do is fire on the machine. We have it hooked it up to a monitor over there. And after we do that, I might try mem testing it with two CPUs. We'll see what happens. The CPU fans are hooked up via three pin to Molex adapters. And then there's also a floppy drive just sitting out of the case. Obviously, the computer is not in a complete working state but we just need to see it power on for tonight. And then I'll call it good and have a second video where I put in the optical drives I want, the floppy drives. It will have a five and a quarter floppy, uh, along with probably two, at least two optical drives, um, maybe more, because I do like to have at least a DVD and CD drive. And then we'll be good to go, along with all the expansion cards that need to be put in as well. But all we need is video, and uh, we got a keyboard connected in, so this should be enough to do the test. All right, so I'm going to plug in the power. The PSUs are flipped into the off state. We 
My arm probably blocked that entire shot. Now I'm going to flip see the power supplies on. Forgot to plug in the motherboard power. So we'll just plug in the motherboard power here. There we go. Now on for the test we were attempting. Power supply is switched off. Power being connected. Connected PSU one and two. Now been powered on. Now for the front panel button. We got power. Not getting anything on the monitor though. Okay, so I did sort of a scorched earth fixing situation to try to make this work. Um, it's working now. I switched out the video card for one that I know that does work. Um, the fan is busted on it, but it functions. Uh, I also loosened some of the motherboard screws. Uh, and then I also did a clear CMOS. System battery is dead. Replace and run setup. Is it? I just replaced that the darn thing. Let's go into the BIOS. Okay, I did do a clear. So we'll leave that date alone. Not sure if you can see that. A, yes, that's correct. Nothing, EGA, BGA. I'd like to have NumLock on. Leave that alone. We'll save changes, shut down, remove power, and try the other graphics card. Or we'll just try rebooting with this one same card and see what happens. Strobe light. <laughs> Doing the RAM count. Well, only mentions one CPU though. I'm not sure if it sees both. Alright, now that we've drained power out of the system, I'm going to switch out the cards again. Hopefully the new card will work. I'd be rather disappointed if it doesn't, because it's much more powerful than this card. Plus this card has a... The, the, card that I, the test card I used has a uh, heat sink with a fan, but the fan is dead. It's kind of built into it. Okay, well, potentially in the end you've seen me install a graphics card. Right above the camera there. All right, with a new card in place, let's see if we still get something from the system. Though I'm surprised that I'm not hearing the system speaker at all. All right, folks, I think the issue might lie well, first of all, I don't know why the um, motherboard speaker nor the case speaker seem to be doing anything as far as sending signals. But I believe that the, the NVIDIA 6200 uses a later um, revision of PCI than this board has. And therefore, it's refusing to even kick on, which is a nice safety feature, I suppose. But... A little irritating when you're trying to troubleshoot. So what happens when we fire up again with the, once again with this, uh, who, it's a PNY card. I don't remember the chipset. Oh, look at that. It's a uh, FX5500. Oh, look at that. 
So it appears to be a card issue. So I may have to use this video card temporarily. Hopefully it won't overheat. It was an active duty in the old computer shop I wor worked in. Um, the computer had been retired, but that system had been an active duty for years with a dead fan. So I imagine that it wasn't exactly necessary. It's a fairly small heat sink. As you can see, the heat sink is rather tiny, but in my mind, it could be that small because it has a spin had a spinning fan. Not worth replacing. It's a good test card, though. All right, so the battery does not seem to be bad. I think what threw um, the BIOS through a fit because I used the jumper to clear the BIOS, so that must have made it look like the battery was bad. But it would be nice if the system told me how many CPUs it sees. At the moment, I can't tell. So I'm going to put in... I'm going to put in my bootable Memtest 86 floppy. And we're going to see what happens when we reset here. Alright, this uh, floppy drive I got from Goodwill. Wasn't sure if it would work. So it seems to see Memtest. How many CPUs? All right, Memtest has found two CPUs, and that's fantastic. And it started both of them. Good. That means the motherboard has properly detected both CPUs. Now I'm going to show you something. And this happened with one CPU. I thought it might be solved with two, but maybe not. I thought that this would have been solved with two CPUs. But it appears that it hasn't been. That Memtest, as wonderful as it is, is a bulky enough program that even two 200 megahertz blacktop Pentium Pros are a bit sluggish when running it. Look at the timer. Look how it spits and sputters and pops up and then look at the um, the state counter. It's not moving very smoothly. Uh, I imagine Memtest was built for later things, but it does recognize what it's working with. So, hey, once again, thank you to the members of whoever made Memtest. You're great. I like to use this old version rather than the newest one. It works. I've never had a problem with it. With that, I'm probably going to leave you be. So what have we learned today, folks? Well, um, there's two possibilities. One is that the PCI 2.1 specifications of this graphics card render it incompatible with these PCI 2.0 slots, or it's a bad card. My guess is that it probably is the PCI 2.1 specifications. I don't know what the differences are as far as these power delivery and whatnot, but it must make enough of a difference. Which means I need to look at an older 5000 series GPU. I cannot continue to use this one. Um, without that fan going, I don't trust it to survive. So I will have to see what's the best 5000 series PCI card I can get. Suggestions would be fantastic. Please, please comment. Uh, please join the retro computing group on Facebook and join the conversation. I would like to know what is the best card I can put in this machine. I Because, well, I want this to be the most, most powerful dual Pentium Pro machine that it can possibly be. With that, I will leave you be. Um, have a good night, uh, happy new year, I know it's been a number of days, uh, plenty of days since it's been New Year's, but enjoy it, and I will see you later. Thanks for watching, like, subscribe, comment, all that stuff. And please do help me out with um, suggesting a graphics card for this build. Good night.